For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going to come back to my study from last night. Need to pick up a few factors about it. I moved to super grace on it, and some people needed to catch up to that concept. Sometimes I think, I think probably ahead rather than build a case. So we're going to come back to where we were last night. Notice I left a blank because I want you to, I want you to be sure you write in the proper stuff, and then we're going to talk about this in more detail. I've got about six points. You can put somewhere. I don't know where you put it, but maybe down below where there's a blank space. You recall from last night, we were into um, the life. We were looking at Joseph out of um, the book of Genesis. We're, we're in the 11th Toledoth of Genesis, and we've been taking special studies out of that. And, and we were talking about uh, Joseph uh, naming his, the way he named his two sons were reflective of the things he had gone through. Um, his earlier stage of, of growth with God and, and in Egypt, and then his latter stage. He talked about uh, troubles in the, with Manasseh, you know, naming Manasseh. He talked about his troubles uh, and how he had to work through them. And then in the second one, he talked about uh, fruitfulness. And so what you have is you have a look at adversity and prosperity. And that's, that's how super grace works. When you hit spiritual maturity, God is going to test you in, in two areas of your life. And it's consistent with anybody who you follow in the Bible uh, that um, is acknowledged to have reached spiritual maturity and maintaining. Uh, they're going to have, Job is a classic example. He had prosperity. God took the prosperity away. Um, and then took his health away from him, and then turned around and gave him prosperity back, didn't he? Because it was all about a test. So, the, so he names one child Manasseh, uh, talking about adversity, and then he names the other one Ephraim, talking about prosperity. And uh, and the key in that whole discussion, when he talks about why he named his children in Genesis 41, which we talked about last night. He says, God made me go through these troubles, and God made me prosperous, I mean fruitful. And he makes that very clear that God did this. God did this. Uh, and probably, as I said last night, probably many of us would say, you know, I wouldn't take anything for what I went through it. I don't necessarily want, wish it to go through again. But the experience I learned about myself and my relationship with the Lord has been really vital to me. And that's kind of what Joseph was saying last night. I mean, if we had to pick adversity or fruitfulness, we'd always pick fruitfulness, wouldn't we? <laughs> it's just human nature. But God knows how to develop us spiritually, and they're both good for us. All things work together for good. When we go through those times of adversity, they're good for our spiritual growth. Uh, I refer to it as, as Joseph going to a pit and turn it into a gym. It was a training ground for him. It was a, it's all about attitude. It's all about attitude towards God and attitude towards his word of God in our life. How, how do we deal with adversity? How do we deal with prosperity? I mean, some people deal with adversity a lot better than they deal with with prosperity. 
uh, even though they want it, you know, they would choose it every time over the other because it's just human nature. So what I want to do to 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 you, to, what I want to do uh, in um, I was headed to another study, and I had counseling this morning at the office, and I found myself talking to people who were struggling in these areas that didn't know how it develops. And so I found myself teaching how you get from one point to the next. I mean, how do you, how do you get from salvation to spiritual maturity and, and from there into a super grace mentality? How, how do you get there? And I found out that uh, they didn't know. And I thought, well. <laughs> so, you know, what good is to talk about over here if you don't know how to get over here. So I, I said, well, I need to go back and tweak this. I need to go back and, and explain this with simplicity to make sure nobody misses this, okay? But it's one thing for me to teach it, and I walk away and go like, oh, good, I did a good study on super grace, and nobody understands what I'm talking about other than language. They don't know the mechanics. I'm a mechanics guy, so. I'm not going to settle for that. So I'm back tonight. I'm back tonight to make sure uh, about this very fact. Now, people often say to me, where do you get the idea of super grace? And why do you attach it to this stage of growth? Why do you, st it, why do you, why do you put it under this grace system? See, this... Here is saving grace, logistic grace. Here is growth grace. Here is suffering grace. Here is dying grace. Here is surpassing grace, you know, in heaven. You know? So, we put super grace here. Now, it expands. We say reach it, maintain it to dying grace. So, it expands. I mean, but this is the key right here. This super grace is going to fall under that. But you're, just because you reach spiritual maturity don't mean that you're going to be able to have a super grace life. You've got to reach it, maintain it to dying grace. It, it's, a, it's your consistency is where the name of the game is. So, but I'm often asked, where do you get this idea? Why do you call this super grace? And in point number three on the back part, on the, uh, point number three, in First Thessalonians, just to give you an example, in, this is one of many, but in Second Thessalonians 1.3, there's a word that you can't really see it in the English, but you can in the Greek. No, and I put it in bold print. See the word hooper, H-U-P-E-R, oxana? Well, see the word oxana, A-U, that's a compound word, hooper and oxana. See, when you get oxana, A-U-X-A-O-N, that is the word growth. That could be physical growth, could be spiritual growth. That word means to grow, to grow up. It could be used with a tree or a flower. You know, you plant one and it grows. You, you plant a seed. And so that's the, that is the standard word for growth period. Now, in context, this is talking about because your faith. So we're talking about a spiritual growth. The word hooper is where you get the word super in English. That's where you get the word. So you've got super growth or super grace. And that's where, that is the, that's the classic, that's the classic word for that. That's the, one of the keys. We, and so here's what Paul wrote. Um, and he starts his book off with this, and that gives you a hint where he's going with Second Thessalonians. <laughs> but he says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, uh, talking about the church, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged. You know, you're not going to get there without faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. But faith is enlarged when you, Second Timothy, look, when, when you 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, look, I keep quoting that. You've got to start learning this stuff. 
You got to start learning where it's found in the Bible. That's inhale, exhale. God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. Old King James. And they were right. The, the word does mean God breathed. And it's inhale, exhale. You got to take it in. You got to. That's what. This is where I get the term. You you learn to live it. You're learning the Bible to live it. Not just learning to learn it. You're learning to live it. And that's that concept. Inhale, exhale. Of Second Timothy, of three, uh, sixteen and seventeen. So that the key behind this idea. And you always ask yourself, I say this in simplistic ways to people who come and talk to me. I say to them, they say, well, I'm struggling with such and such. Here's what I always say. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? And uh, many times they don't know. And so my second question is, look, at whatever they were talking to me about, I say, show me the Bible. What's the key word of what you're discussing? What, where is your problem? And they'll, they'll give me a word. I'll say, okay, get me a scripture for it. And they go like, well, I don't know. I don't have one. I said, well, you have a Bible. How come you can't get a scripture? And nine times out of ten, they don't know they have a concordance in the back of their study Bible because they don't pay any attention to that tool kit. They've got a tool chest and never look in it. And so I say to them, well, let's see. Here's a key word. Let's, I can find it with your Bible. Go to the back of your Bible and find your concordance. And let's look and see if we can find that word. Nine times out of ten, you can always find it. Even in a simple, the, your, the concordance in the back of your Bible is not an exhaustive concordance, but it's a very good one. And nine times out of ten, I mean, very seldom do I ever have anybody that, that says, well, here's my problem. I say, well, what's the Bible say? They go like, I don't know. That's why I'm here. I said, well... Let's cut your visitation down on you because you can go to the Word of God on this. Okay? And so we go through it. We find it. We look it up. We read it. And, and they go like, cha-ching. So here's my point. You got to inhale and exhale. You, the, the, and, and, and the breathing is the name of the game with the Word of God. You're learning to live it. Now, the second thing that's most important about this, I'm going to have a word of prayer in a moment. But the, most second, the second thing that's most important about this, other than, okay, the Bible says it, is to have, to be sure that you have the right, always a, a steady, good, go-get-it attitude about the Word of God to fit your need. Whatever you're struggling with in your life, God has a word for it. And when you hear it and put your faith in it, God responds to that to do. Listen, the reason you need to have the attitude, a, a proper attitude. Look, look, here's how Paul said it. Here's how Paul said it. He said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Now, how does that happen? First of all, you study the Bible and then you keep that prevalent. When you have a conflict or something comes up, you go, to, you go to it, and then you, you, that is your attitude towards it. When you look it up, and the Bible says, like I was talking to a person today about, with the word seal. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Well, we couldn't find it, so we went to a concordance, and there it is. Okay, there it is. So we looked it up, and you go like, okay, there's your answer. Now, what's your attitude? See, there's the answer. Now, what's your attitude? Well, your attitude is what takes it from learning to living. It's your attitude, your attitude towards the Word of God. And when you put your positive attitude to, to faith to work that, okay, I believe that, I'm going to believe. I, listen, one thing is to know what the Bible says. The other, no, other thing is to know that God will do what he says. So when you, when, and here was the trouble we had today. We looked up this word, and then you go, okay, okay how, does it, how does it work in your life? So it requires Romans 4.21. It always requires Romans 4.21. What God has promised, he is able to perform. That's your attitude. And when you have that attitude and you see it and it works, now you have the mind of Christ because God is faithful. 
that's mental preparation for, for learning the Word of God and living it. See, once you begin to live the Word of God and you begin to see God do supernatural, unbelievable, unmistakable things in your life, you have an appetite for the Word of God. And until that clicks in your soul, you don't have that. You're a nod to God guy. When it's, everything's going my way, then, hey, God, I mean, it's good to be with you. When, when, when he begins to roll over you and test you a little bit and say, okay, let's get ready, then it's, uh, well, I, I must have made a mistake. I'm going to the wrong church. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there is a word, and, and another word for super grace in understanding it is on your paper is James 4, 6. This was a word that was given to me early in my studies on this subject matter. It doesn't speak as well to the subject, in my opinion, as 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, but it does speak about it. In James, he says, but he gives, he gives greater grace. And the, the word greater is the word megas on your paper. See? And then karos is the word grace. He gives greater grace. God gives greater grace. Greater grace... You know, you got great, greater, greatest. So you're you're in the ballpark moving. See? So that's another. And there are many other ones. But th these are landmark ones to talk about. Uh, talk about what we call getting into spiritual growth where you're actually, where God is actually working supernatural stuff through grace in your life. And you know, we all have a frame of reference for it. It's our salvation. When I heard, when I heard super, gra super grace concept, I knew right away that that was, that was legit because I, super grace is how I got saved. <laughs> I mean, not me, but from God's end of it. He did a super work on me. And then when I learned I had I had received 50 things I could never lose, lose in time, time or eternity, I went, that's super. <laughs> but it was God doing it to me. Then he turned around and says, you know, this is, this is a program for your life. This is just a salvation program. This is a program for your life, son. I went, cha-ching. I want that deal. I want that deal. Because my, my salvation still... My salvation to this very day is just giant in my life. Well, let's have a word for I'll give you that moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to privilege to confess sin. First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That allows the Holy Spirit to minister the truth of the Word of God, and you need him tonight to teach you this. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be with these people both by automobile and in the setting of the classroom as well as the Internet as we travel across space and time to meet with people all over the world. Who would have ever believed that? And I'm thankful to be a part of that. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of, of the Word of God tonight about the awesomeness of grace, greater grace. The, the grace that flows out of Calvary, the grace that flows from the cross, from the gospel to my life, all the way to death and beyond, is just an amazing grace. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and verse 14. Uh, well, 3 and 4. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 2. Uh, none of this is on your paper. So you're going to have to write a little bit. I just gave you paper. <laughs> That's about it. And you, you, you ought to write that on your paper. I'm at Saving Grace right now. I'm in 1 Timothy, and I'm down here at Saving Grace. And he's going to tell you something here. Now that you're older and more mature, he's going to tell you in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, he's going to tell you something really interesting about God's desire to save you. This is good and acceptable, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Okay, look at verse 4. 
who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? It is God's desire. Listen to me. Here, here we are right here. It's God's desire to save you. It's God's desi desire to take you through the growth channel of grace all the way to die, uh, all the way to surpassing grace. That's his desire. It is his desire not only to save you, but for you now, now that you're saved, for you to come to the knowledge, right? To come to knowledge. To come to knowledge of the truth. And that's a very big deal. The word for knowledge is interesting because that word is not gnosis. That word is epinosis. And that word means that gnosis is learning it and epinosis is applying it. You're learning to live it. You're not just learning to learn it. That's epinosis. Epinosis is bringing the gnosis into full experience of your life. And, and, and that means into a deeper relationship with God himself. Epinosis brings you into Romans 4.21 where you can write it in your journal. What God has promised, he is able to perform. And you're able to write that into your journal. You can say, here is the promise and here is the performance. Here's what God did. And listen, you can go back to the cross when, when he told you, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. You said here today, absolutely convinced you're saved. And, and listen, who doesn't write down in their, well, I remember exactly. I remember everything about mine. Now, I grant you, I was older when I got saved. By older, I mean, you know, 23 or something. I wasn't three or four. I mean, I was a grown man with some world in me. Okay? So, look, it's God's desire. You know, it, it, it's interesting. This is his desire. It's his desire. It's his desire that none perish but all come to eternal life, Second Peter 3, 9. It is his desire that none perish. It's his desire you be saved. But now that you're saved, it's his desire that you begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge, the word is gnosis. And what he wants you to do is to grow in the knowledge of the word of God and then see the power of God work it out in your life. See him do the power structure in your life. God is faithful to do what he's promised. And that's, that's, the, that's the real deal. For example, prayer. If you prayed all the time and never got answered, never got an answer, and you went through the Bible and studied it correctly and prayed correctly and never got an answer, never feel that God's always closed the door on you, would take you long to shut down prayer life. I mean, how long are you going to walk by faith if you never see faith do what is promised? Because your, your other option is greater. Sight. Faith is your eyes wide open and sight you're blind. Think about that. So, God our Savior. That's how Paul says this. God our Savior. You want to get this point now. God desires all men. God desires all people to be saved. And he desires all saved people to come to Epinosa's knowledge. You understand that? It's his desire. 
I mean, you don't get, listen, there's, not, there's nothing stronger to discuss from God says it's my desire. You go, well, what, what does God want from me? Well, when he tells you what his desires is, you got it. Right? No questioning that. I mean, desire is an interesting word. So, you understand right off the bat that his desire is for all men to be saved and all saved to come to knowledge of the truth. Why? The truth, because it sets you free. He just doesn't want you to be knowledge. He wants you to come to knowledge of the truth because it was Jesus who said in John 8, 32, the truth will set you free. Free from what? From the sight of cosmic thinking. That's why. So, that's the first thing. Now, when you look from salvation to spiritual growth maturity, that journey is a journey of milk. That's, it's milk. It's milk. That is milk. And there are three stages of growth in this. There's the baby stage, the immature stage, until you reach maturity. This is the mature stage. There's three stages. And there are words for them. There are Greek words. For example, the baby stage is called brethos. Brethos. The immature stage is called napios. And the mature stage is called teleos. Brethos, B-R-E. I think there's an S in there. Brethos. Well, I, I don't. No, I guess it's just brethos. Napios, N-E-P-I-O-S, long E. And then teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. Teleos. Okay? These are three stages of growth. Three stages of growth. And the, these two stages right here, not that one, but these two stages, baby and immature, require milk. They require milk. And when you come out of napios and into maturity, the, the, you, be, as you enter into this, you become a meat eater. Become a meat eater. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. In 1 Peter 2.2, 2, here I am with Brethos. Here I am Brethos. Here is 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word so that they may grow in respect to their salvation. That's a key. And milk is all about securing their concept of, uh, of salvation. This is where we we introduce them to the 50 things and make sure that they have the assurance of their salvation scripturally, that they have a Bible verse that says, like 1 John 5, 11 through 13, if any man is in Christ, uh, he has eternal life. Eternal life is in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have eternal life, for example. And at the point of salvation, every man is in Christ. See? 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man, a, a, a new creature is one in Christ. If you're, in, if you're into Christ, you're a new creation. You're, you've been born again. So the, there, there is this. Now, there is also, in the baby stage, there is also a Hebrews uh, 5.13 that takes this baby stage and takes us into Napios, as still needing milk, still needing milk. For example, over in Hebrews, if you go over to Hebrews, because we're going to get two out of there. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Verse 13. Fifth chapter 13. Now, watch this. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed, is not accustomed uh, to the word of righteousness, for he's a baby. Right? 
the word for baby there is not brethos, it's napios. It's napios. It's not the mother's milk, it's bottle milk. It's the formula business that we're working with. See, that's Hebrews 5.13. 5, Notice 14, we'll, we'll jump to 14 for a moment to talk about meat. But solid food or meat, King James, is for the mature. That's the teleos. That's teleos. The word mature. See? So, here we got a, we got a baby believer th 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 that's just been born on the mother's milk. We've got a napios on the milk after weaned off the breast still a baby, still an infant that goes all the way into maturity until he becomes a meat eater. This is Paul, the way Paul describes it. Right? This is the way Paul describes it. So, see, you start out a newborn babe and what is important for you is salvation. The aspect of salvation and getting secured in your salvation. As you get secured in your salvation, then you move, you move to another system of milk. Now you get into the 50 things and you begin to look at and you get into the, the word of God that gives you the uh, assurance of your salvation. The word of God is the only place that you can get assurance of your salvation. You, you know, you look at uh, John 10. You look, at, you look at John 10, 28 through 30. You look at 1 John 5, 11 through 13, passages like this that says you have eternal life. And when you believe that, then you have the assurance. And you can always go back to the Word of God that, that where your assurance is. Your assurance is in the Word of God. God is faithful to His Word. Right? When I throw the Bible away, then I become an insecure person. Because it's the first thing you know, I forgot about it, and I don't know where to get it anymore. So th that, that's important you do that. Now, uh, let me show you this thing about a napios. Let me show you this napios. Uh, let's go to, for, for, uh, we looked at 14, right? Solid food is the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. All right? That's the mature guy. That's not, not, none of these people. But this is the mature guy now, Okay? So I want you to go to 1 Corinthians with me, just showing you how the Greek words are used uh, to explain to us spiritual growth momentum. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, where he's talking about carnality and spirituality. I'm in the third chapter, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of the flesh, as babes in Christ. See that? Now listen to me. That's an apios. That's an apios. That's an immature person. It's not a newborn baby. But it's, it's a person between birth and adulthood. That person. I could not speak to you. I could not speak to you as to spiritual men. But as to men of the flesh. In other words, here is a baby believer that's struggling between spirituality and carnality. I mean, that's what the subject is of 1 Corinthians 3. He's struggling between uh, flesh, he's struggling between carnality and spirituality. Right? So he, somebody has to come along and has got to begin to teach him about the eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. And one of those works, right? I mean, he, he, down here is that in this early stage, he's learned that in the 50 things, there are eight works of the Holy Spirit of salvation. So he learns that. He goes like, wow, I never knew that. Wow, that's interesting. Then he gets in a struggle in his life, which is normal, flesh versus spirit. Now he's ready to be taught. Look, you remember when we taught you the eight things that you received at salvation? Yes, I remember. Well, one of them that's key now is the indwelling. So I'm going to teach you everything I know about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because this is how you walk in the Spirit, right? This is the time that that person needs that information. This is when I would teach him the four circles of spirituality. I would teach him the four circles of spirituality. 
Okay? Now, I don't have time tonight to teach you those, but I've taught those to you several times. Now I would teach you the four, I would teach him the four circles because he could visualize it. He could actually see how that thing works. See? And so he says, I gave, but look at verse 2. I mean, 1 Corinthians 3, 2. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. This is why, this is why he is struggling where he is. Because now one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit has to be brought into an advanced doctrine. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Your body's the temple of God. Now you've got to learn how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he begins to learn that, then he's going to begin to move towards maturity. And, he, and when he begins to win the struggle over the flesh versus the spirit of Galatians 5, 16, and 17, then the next thing he's going to struggle with is the walking by faith and not sight. That's the next thing he's going to struggle with. As an apios, that's the next thing he's going to... And so you teach him, you teach him the, the faith cycle because he's ready now to understand that faith comes by hearing. Hearing has got to be believed. Believing has got to be applied. Yada, yada. Right? And listen, now he's learned the two great secrets of reaching uh, spiritual maturity, being consistent in his walk in the Spirit, Right? You teach him. You teach him how to, you know, confess sin. You're not losing your salvation. Right? You have to do this. This is a immature believer who is moving towards maturity, and he's got to learn this. And you just life coach him. You just coach him in there. I spend I spend almost all of my time dealing with people, not necessarily from my church, but people who are sent to me by you people. That this is, this is what I do with them. I get a napkin, start this thing. I take them as far as I can take them. Most of the time, I never get past this. Because they, they don't know how to, they just don't know how to walk in the spirit. They don't, know, they don't know the four circles. I have to go through the four circles. They don't know how to walk by faith. I have to go through the faith cycle. And th then they go home. They do exercises. They write in their journal for me, and then they come back, and we, we, then we tweak it. And we may have to tweak it several times, but we got them actually out there in the gym. We're not sitting home thinking about how I'm going to get healthy. We're actually in the gym. We're doing the gym exercises, spiritual, the spiritual gym. And so for me, that, this is and very seldom, very seldom do I ever get past there unless I got somebody dying over here. I very seldom ever get past that. Even if a person's suffering him, he don't know how to do that, and so they're all screwed up. They don't understand. They don't understand the, 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 three, the three classifications of suffering. I want to show you another one. I, I'm, still, I'm still on this little system over here, okay? I'm on that little system. And listen, I don't care. I'm not in a hurry to get through with this. You understand? If I have to come back next week and teach this, this has got to be taught. All right. So I'm in no hurry to go with this, okay? So I'm in the 13th, because I, I got way too fast last night. I got way too fast for the material I had, thinking that everybody up to speed, and they weren't. So I'm in the, now I'm in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just working with this word, napios. I want you to see the power of this word, napios. You, listen, you're going to meet, I meet more, most of the people that are sent to me are, are napios. They're not baby believers. They, they've sat under guys who have got them secured in their salvation, and, and that's, that's about it. They, they preach a good gospel, and uh, they've got them secured in their salvation. But they're, they're an apios. And I find, I find this one a lot, and it's a sign of napios. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm in verse 11. In verse 11, when I was a child... I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child, but when I became a man. The word for child there is napios, and the word for man is telios. And you know what you see? You see believers who have been in church a long time. You see believers who may have been actively engaged in things in the church for a long time, 
who are in APIs. And they think because they go to church and because they serve in the choir, they teach in the Sunday school, they do this and they do that, that somehow they're going to be mature. And most of them that I meet are secured in their salvation, but they're in APIs. You know why? Because their behavior identifies it. Now listen to what he says just in case. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child. I used to think as a child. I used to reason as a child. I use that as my guideline. I go, okay, let's talk about it. I listen to them, and there's my guide. This is my guide with them. They speak like a child. They, they, they think like a child. They reason like a child. Guess what I got? Right? You know, the old saying, if it quacks and, and it has a walk, then, you know, it's probably a duck. You know? So I go by that same, I don't, this is not brain surgery or anything. I'm not trying to, I mean, this is just how the Bible says to identify him, agreed? And listen, and so, listen, when I became a man, I did away with childish things. Because they don't make sense anymore. I, they, they don't make it, they don't, they, they, there's no reason to speak about it because they're stupid. You see? I don't do those things anymore. This is stupid. I, I got so much trouble for it. That's really important. And then he goes on, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face-to-face -face business. I'm just taking a little passage out of a deal on spiritual gifts and show you napios versus teleos. Okay? And, and I use that as my guide when I'm listening to somebody. I just listen to that as a guide. If they... You know, if they walk like a duck and quack like a duck. and So there it is. Okay? Now, the teleos, when that person has a desire to eat meat, see, now he's, he's wanting advanced doctrines of the... Now he's wanting advanced doctrines. He's wanting to know more about the thing. And it's hard. When they get close to it, it's hard to hold them back here but they're going to get in trouble in their life. They're, they're going to have problems with their flesh. They're going to have problems with the faith system. And so you have to bring them back here. But they want some of this over here. And so they're ready to go with this. And listen, once they get hungry for the word now, but you see, when they reach spiritual maturity, I call that super grace one. Listen, I don't mean, that don't mean you've arrived and you're there. It just means, it just means you got there. Now, we, and, and I love this because Bob taught us there, that it's one thing to reach it, it's another thing to maintain it, and it's another thing to maintain it, to die in grace. And, and he's absolutely, listen, he is absolutely on the money with it, and that's a great line. You've got to reach it, you've got to keep it, and you've got to keep it till you die. And, and Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, 7 and 8. You know, I've entered the race, I'm, I'm going to run the course, I'm going to finish it, I'm going to keep the faith, and then there's a crown for me. He carries it all the way through there to surpassing grace. And, and uh, Peter does it. Peter does it when he writes, when Paul writes his, his will and testimony, that's 2 second, that's second Timothy. When Peter writes it, it's 2 it's Peter. And Peter tells you the same thing. So it, it's... Um, it's kind of interesting. Let's see. Got a, let me, I wrote a verse down here. Let me see what it says. Well, that's not really that big. Um, so it's one thing to reach it and to move that through uh, Super Grace 2 to Super Grace right here, Super Grace 3. You got to reach it. You got to maintain it. See, look, if you think that's easy, let me tell you what happens. The warfare heats up like you can't believe. In the, the intensity of the angelic conflict heats up better than you could possibly. Let me show you some guys that didn't make it. Let me show you. Saul didn't make it. Had every chance in the world. Had a great pastor teacher. Had the word of God had a calling, knew he had been called, knew he had been appointed, had all that going, didn't reach it. I mean, he had it, but he couldn't maintain it. He didn't have a desire, didn't have a desire to maintain it. Couldn't do it. 
And you know why? Listen to me. I'm going to tell you what gets you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you exactly. This is what God has taught me this last year. Let me tell you exactly how you get knocked out of super grace one, two, and three. And you get knocked out all the way down the pike until you get to three. Let me tell you how, how it happens. Listen to me. You don't pay attention to the details of the directive will of God. Oh, you've got the general view. You've got the directive will. You've got a good general view of it. But when you get to super grace and he gives you the details of his will, how he wants it performed, you better do it on the letter. Listen, God told him exactly. Here's what I want you to do. God says to Saul, here's, how, here's exactly what I want you to do in chapter 13 and 14. He doesn't do it. He does it generally, doesn't do it specifically. Then we get to the last war with the Amalekites, and God again tells him exactly how he wants it done, letter by letter, point one, point two, point three, point four, point five. See, when you're over here immature, God lets you slide on the generals to the specifics trying to teach you that. When you're over here, he don't let you slide anymore. There's no more sliding. You salute and get it done. You salute and get it done. You complete the mission. The mission is the most important thing. Now listen to me. I'm telling you, the absolute straight up. And listen, when you, when you hit spiritual maturity, he expects you, he expects you to get interested in the details of the Word of God and not just in the broad idea. I meet people, they got a broad idea about the will of God. That You say, yeah, but what about this, this, and that? And they say, well, I, I don't know. See? You got real problems with that, people. And when you know that well, he lays that deal out, this is what knocks you out of this one. This is what puts you back over here. And listen, he's long patient with you too. I'll tell you another guy that got knocked out of there. And he was sitting right here. He was sitting on the door of that. Moses. Moses. And listen, Aaron too. When he tells Moses, he says, you and your brother, neither one going over. You know why? Details. They violated the details of the directive will of God. You've got to pay attention. All the spiritual information you got, he now is going to require it of you. And let me tell you, when you reach, the, when you reach spiritual maturity and he tells you specific things about your marriage, you're held accountable. You are held accountable. When he tells you specific things about your job or, or any other issue, when he gets specific, when now you've advanced. You know what advanced thinking in the Word of God is? You're getting more information. More is expected of you. I can't begin to tell you. It's one thing to know that God has a directive will. But listen, when he lays it out and he tells you this is it, and I don't want this, I want this from you. He's not going to put up with you over here in the Nap over here in Napias. He put up the he lets you slide a little bit here and there because you're you're just a kid. We all know that. Just a kid. You made a kid mistake. Not here, buddy. You're no longer a kid. You're a man. You got to man up. And, and he's going to hold you accountable. You cannot slide in that. And there's plenty of you study Numbers 20, he, in Numbers 20 with Moses, in Numbers 20, 8 through about 12, he says to Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. Moses goes out and strikes the rock. Paul says, let me tell you why that was tough, because Moses understood that rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians, the t 1 Corinthians 10th chapter says that rock he struck was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, verse 4. Christ was all about the manna that came out of heaven and the water that came out of the rock, man. I mean, you, you, you go through this Christianity stuff just trying to, you can't play both of them. When he tells you this is sin and you go like, yeah, I know, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Listen, there's going to be penalty for that. Listen, but when you hit super grace and you do that, listen, there's a great falling out. It's not a slap on the hand. 
What? First John one nine. How about that? You know why? Grace. Grace. That's how you get back on your feet. That's how you get back on your feet. The work of Christ on the cross is still available to you until you're dead. That propitious work of Christ on the cross that cleanses you from sin works to your dying day. You're never, there's never a day that God doesn't offer it to you until you're dead. This, listen, this is not complicated. This thing works really simple. It all starts with the cross. And, the, you, and listen, at some point, instead of going to the cross, you carry it. And you know why you carry it? You carry it for others. Arthur Blessed, back in, uh, in our day, we knew Arthur, uh, Horton and I, and when, Arthur, when Arthur, I remember sitting and having coffee with him when he got the idea that he was going to carry across, across America and preach the gospel from it. He said, I think bearing the cross means to be able to preach Christ wherever you are, I'm going to visualize it. And so he carried his cross. Listen, and the next time I heard from him, he had, crossed it, he had carried it across to Europe and was at it. I don't know if he went around the world or not with that thing. Listen, it was an idea that God put in him that carry the cross, make it visible. This is what it means to carry the cross. For him, it meant the visualness of my life for Christ. My life is all about the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, you know, you could, for him, he went visual with it because he was an evangelist. And, but it was a concept that he had. A baby believer don't do that, and Napios doesn't do it, but a super grazer does. He understands that he's in this world. To, listen, what good is it to talk about Jesus Christ if you haven't got a clear gospel that, that, that allows other people in? I mean, the first thing I ask anybody, I don't care who they are. Listen, I ask preachers if they come and see me. I go through the gospel with them. I don't take for anything for granted. I'm a messenger. I've got to find out who I'm talking to. I don't know where to go. Well, of course. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course he had, the, he had it because of shadow Christology. Yes. Yeah, he'd, he'd had to make a sacrifice with it. Yeah. To so, show good faith. Because, listen, after he did that one, God shut him down. God took him to the mountain, let him see it, and says, you can't go because, and I'll tell you why. He did it because of his leadership ability and influence over other people, and he told them that in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, um, verses 50 and 51. Without your gospel. Well, yeah. That was the whole story. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, he struck the rock, man. He's supposed, he's supposed to speak it. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, I'm just, I'm just trying to show you some things. The third thing I want you to understand, right? Third thing, I guess I'm just going to get three out of six. The third thing I want you to understand is the difference between gnosis, which is a big deal to the napios, and epinosis, that's a big, big deal to the mature person. This is a big deal. Now, I mentioned some of these scriptures. There is a, listen, a spiritual mature person, is all, he, he, his whole mind is dealing with epinosis, the application of the word of God. That's the reason I did the faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, hearing, believing, believing by application, application by completion of God. I did that to show that absolute cycling is important. So over here, gnosis is a big deal. Big deal to an, uh, uh, this person, he's in the learning stage. But over here, he's in the living the word out. Epinosis is a key word. 
the, it is the full experience of what the Word of God has said. And so, uh, in 1 Corinthians, for example, in 1 Corinthians 8, chapter, verse 1, he speaks about the danger of gnosis in the life of a mature believer. Gnosis is a very, it, listen, if gnosis is not taking the epinosis, if you stop and you think that that's the name of the game, he says then that puffs you up. Like in 1 Corinthians 8, chapter, verses 1 through 3, uh, since I'm not going to get anywhere any time, any, that's this anyhow. Um, I'm in the 8th eight, chapter, ver, first three verses. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, this was an issue. We know that we have knowledge. That's gnosis. Knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. Why? They had the knowledge, but they, they wouldn't put into epinosis. They wouldn't put into practice. He wanted the law of love exercised with these weak believers these believers were struggling with this specific issue, and the, these people who, who said they were mature weren't mature because they were given a knowledge without love. Ep, they, he wanted epinosis. He wanted them to be instructed with love. He says, if anyone supposed that he knows anything, he has, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. He says, listen, just don't give them the Listen, they need, they need to understand why gnosis has to be taken to epinosis. And you're there to explain to them, to, to sh show them epinosis love. Epinosis love. Now, when, when you drop down into verses 11 through 13, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. You're, you're telling him what he ought to do and not equipping him how to do it. Therefore, it becomes blame. That's not what the Christian church is about. For through your knowledge, he, he who is weak is ruined and the brother for whose sake Christ died. And thus, by sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. See, that's what you talked about a moment ago with Moses. See? And he said, look, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Then in verse 13, he says, therefore, if food, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will neither eat meat again. And he's talking about food you know, meat sacrifice to idols again, that I might not cause my brother to stumble. Listen, that's the name of the game. I mean, you, you're, all, you're quick to correct him with the word of God, but not teach him how to correct it in his life. Love goes a step beyond that. It, and listen, if your brother is immature, weak in his conscience, because he's struggling with issues, he doesn't have the maturity to do it, then you extend love to him and be patient with him and nurture him into the growth. If he is interested, right, then you walk the walk with him. He's a napios. He's a napios, and it's going to take a little bit. He's got to, he's got to understand spirituality. He's got to understand the walk of faith. He's got to understand the walk of the Spirit. You've got to nurture him. You've got to work with him, and he needs to see love, not criticism. He's, a he's, he's, he's an immature believer. He needs love, not just critical knowledge. Legalism is the worst of that. I mean, they pound you with the law and judge you over it. Well, that's as far as I can get tonight. I, I, didn't, get to, I didn't really get to epinosis, which is the, the big deal. But... You know, depending on the Lord where I go with this, I don't know. But listen, I've got some other things that are really important I need to share with you over here. I'm going to, I'm going to show you why these two power systems, it's important in the Christian life. There are two power systems. There's conformity to the world, and there's transformation in the Word of God. And these two power systems are really important. You understand the difference. Because I'll tell you, in the church today, I meet so many people 
that don't understand the difference between these two power systems. The devil runs one and the Lord runs the other. The devil runs a conformity system. And, and let me tell you what I've discovered. I've discovered that the devil is a master psychologist. He has studied human nature since Adam. And he has been a great observant of it. And he understands conformity of the world. You do not want to play in that ballpark. Because you're whipped right off the start, baby. God has the alternative. The alternative to conformity to the world is transformation by the Word of God. And when I went through the book of Job with you, I learned so many great lessons. And one of the great lessons I learned that Job taught me is the difference in these two power systems and how they work against you and work for you. And I learned that in Job. I learned it in the devil's conversation with the Lord. His strategy with conformity of the world. And uh, I'll come back to this another day. But let me tell you, boy, does he know how to work old man. He understands human behavior more than you and I will ever know it because he studied since the beginning of time. Think what, listen, he studied, he's got it down to his science. And he's been with some great ones. And he didn't even back down. He believed, he was so confident in the conformity to the world that he, he tried it on Jesus Christ. That's pretty bold. That's pretty confident in it. Because it had worked so well with him on others. Moses and Saul and. Well, yeah, most people do. Most people do. In the conformity to the world, they all do. He got them, didn't he? That's right. He understood where transformation comes from. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get out of here tonight. Thank you. I'm not through with this. I may be through it for now, but I'm not through with it. Okay? I am not through with it. The Lord kept me up all night last night. I did not want to come back and teach on this. and Because I already had one hot on me. And he went out, throw it aside. So I've learned to be obedient for whatever reason. And so we'll just see where he goes with this. But this is something you got to understand. And he made it very clear to me. We're going to get up and we're going to do it. I, I want you to write a passage down. I missed this. I just saw it on my paper. And it's a big one too. Uh, and it involves my life to you. Romans, the second chapter, verses 19 through 21. Romans 2, 19 through 21. It's a, it, 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 it will show you why I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, what he put in my heart. Okay, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way both by automobile and by Internet. And we've tried to walk this thing through, Father, to try to make people understand the importance of spiritual growth and, and, and why there needs to be they need to get into a teaching church. They need to set under, not just, I'm not the only guy doing this. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying this is very, very important. They need to find a good Bible teaching church. They need to, they need to study the Word of God. They need to understand some of these basic principles. And if there are pastors out there, they, they need to get this stuff. They need to get this in their soul. They need to get it in their life. They need to cycle it in their own life, begin to teach the truth. Epinosis, that this knowledge is the knowledge of the truth. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life.